Hi guys, welcome back to our physical chemistry lecture series. So we just finished discussing real gas equations of state, which we've been able to apply to our fluid state, that is gases and liquids. So now we're going to start looking at different properties of fluids as well as their interactions with solid surfaces. So here are some of the topics we'll be discussing. So I'll be looking at viscosity, which is a property of both gases and liquids. And we'll also look at surface tension, which is mostly a liquid interface property, and adsorption. So this is going to be uh, the interaction of fluids on the surface of a solid. So our approach is going to be similar. We'll be looking at some experimental data and observations, and we'll create models to represent these phenomena mathematically, which is essentially what we've been doing in our last two lectures. Okay, so let's start with viscosity. So viscosity is defined formally as the resistance to flow or the resistance that one part of a fluid offers to the flow of another part of a fluid. Okay, so intuitively, we know viscosity to be kind of like the stickiness of a liquid, especially. Okay, so if we're comparing, say, water and honey, we definitely know that honey tends to flow a lot slower, and it tends to be more sticky, therefore it's more viscous. Okay, so viscosity, what it does cause viscosity is that it's the internal friction of molecules. So while we're familiar with viscosity as a liquid property, it's also a property of gases. In fact, it's present in both real gases and ideal gases, and of course, are liquids. All right, so let's try to visualize what happens in our fluid when we're trying to describe what viscosity really is. Okay, so for our model, we'll be visualizing our fluid stratified into layers. So our layers are moving past one another in a particular direction. So we can see the arrows here. So we've just uh, distinguished our fluid into these three different layers over here. So say that we're pouring our fluid in a particular direction, namely the x direction, but as we're trying to make our fluid flow in this direction, there's going to be friction between the layers. So namely, some causes of this friction include momentum transfer and intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so since our molecules have kinetic energy, they're going to be moving around randomly. So they won't necessarily want to move in the direction that we want them to move in. Okay, so let's focus on, say, this particular molecule over here. So say that it has a velocity vector going in this direction. Okay, so it's going to resist the movement of going in the x direction here, the positive x direction here. In addition, we call this momentum transfer because as this molecule is moving over here, it's going to start to influence the movement of this molecule. So say this molecule is actually following along. It's going to collide with this molecule, have some momentum transfer, and cause this molecule to go off course, for example. Okay, so this is where momentum transfer causes the so-called internal friction in our fluid and prevents it from flowing in a particular direction that we want. Okay, so as for in intermolecular forces of attraction, so this is a little bit more easier to visualize. So if we want our layers to move in a direction, it's possible that the molecules are going to be attracted to one another. So instead of flowing past one another, they might start sticking to one another instead. Okay, so for example, if this particular molecule is attracted to the other layers, okay, so instead of moving forward, it's going to be pulled towards the other molecules in the system over here. Okay, so that is another source of internal molecular friction. Okay, so we could also visualize this in 3D. Okay, so instead of that two-dimensional picture, we now have this uh, 3D picture as to what's happening between our two layers. So our model here is going to be consisted of two parallel planes of area A. Okay, so we have layer A and layer B, and they're separated by distance dy. Okay, so layer A is moving a little faster than layer B. So in fact, the velocities are v plus dv, so this is a very small difference that layer A is moving faster by. Okay, so overall these two layers are slipping past one another. However, it's possible that there's going to be some 
friction between these two layers is going to prevent layer A from moving a little faster. Okay, so let's look at the different factors that's going to influence this friction. Okay, so our friction will be represented by F here. So it's going to be proportional to the area of these layers. Okay, so if we have a greater area, there's, if there's greater contact, there's going to be greater friction. Okay, so it's also going to be proportional to how much faster layer A wants to be moving. Okay, so if we tend to try to move faster in a particular direction, we'll be experiencing greater friction as well. Okay. It's also going to be inversely proportional to the distance between the layers. Okay, so overall, if we have a larger distance between the layers, we expect to have lower friction. Okay, so if they're farther apart from one another, say that the major cause of internal friction is intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so if they're going to be too far apart from one another, the intermolecular forces of attraction won't be able to take hold as much. All right, so we could multiply all these terms together to look at the overall influence of all these with friction. Okay, so we have the friction being proportional to the area times the change in velocity divided by the distance between the two layers. So again, in order to get rid of this proportionality symbol, we could introduce a proportionality constant. So that proportionality constant, we'll be calling it eta. We'll be using this fancy uh, n-like symbol. So it's going to be eta a dv dy. Okay. So this proportionality constant, so this is called eta, this is actually our viscosity coefficient. Okay, so this viscosity coefficient, this is characteristic for each type of gas. So if you want to figure out the units of eta, or viscosity coefficient, we could solve for eta from the equation that we just derived earlier. Okay, so eta is equal to the force divided by area times dx over dv. Okay, so dx, this is also just the distance between the two layers that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so the units for force, that is just newton. The units for area, that is meter squared. The units for dx, that's meter, and for velocity, it's meters over second. So with some simplification, we end up with newton over meter squared times second. So this unit should be familiar to you guys. So this is the unit for pressure. Okay, So the SI unit for pressure is equal to the pascal. So overall, we could express eta, the units for eta, as pascal times second. Okay, so if we break this down even further to the basic SI units, okay, so the Newton is equal to kilograms times meters over second squared, over a meter squared second. So we could simplify this, and this will be equal to just kilograms over meters times seconds. Okay, so this is the SI unit. So we also have another unit that is commonly used. So this is called the poids. Okay, so it's also symbolized by P. So it's just equivalent to 0.1 of a pascal second or 0.1 of a kilograms meter second. Okay, so keep these unit conversions in mind. All right, so let's check out the viscosity of gases. So we could investigate the experimental trends and try to rationalize the molecular basis of the viscosity of gases. Okay, so the experimental trend is that if we increase the temperature, the viscosity coefficient of our gases also tends to increase. Okay, so recall again the two major causes of the internal friction of our molecules, and that is momentum transfer and intermolecular forces of attraction. However, since we're dealing with gases, intermolecular forces of attraction is not going to be that significant. And since, again, we're dealing with gases, their kinetic energies tend to be very high. So therefore, there's a greater chance that there's going to be a lot of momentum transfer in our gas. So the viscosity of gases is explained primarily by momentum transfer rather than intermolecular forces of attraction. 
Okay, so imagine your gas molecules moving around and you're trying to pour it in a certain direction. So there's going to be a lot of resistance to that since your gas molecules tend to randomize themselves rather quickly instead of tending to flow in the direction that you want it to. So this equation over here was derived from the kinetic molecular theory. Okay, so its derivation is quite involved. So I'll just give you guys the overall result of this derivation. So this is for ideal gases. Okay, so the viscosity coefficient is related to 5 pi over 32 times lambda. So lambda, recall again, this is the mean free path. Okay, velocity, the average velocity, and our density of the gas. Okay, so actually we could use this equation in order to solve for certain parameters such as the molecular diameter. Okay, so how can we get this? Okay, so recall that our expression for mean free path included the molecular diameter term. Okay, so we could use this equation in order to solve for that. Okay, so let's use the equation for eta in order to solve for molecular diameter. Alright, so let's write down what we know for now. So eta is equal to 5 pi over 32 times mean free path times average velocity times density. So we have expressions for all of these three parameters. So we know that density from the ideal gas equation is equal to pressure times molecular weight over RT. And average velocity, so we, dis we discussed this earlier, so this is equal to 8RT over molecular weight pi. And we also know that mean free path, this is equal to, okay, so we'll change this up a bit. So we'll write it in terms of R instead. So mean free path is equal to RT over square root of 2 pi dA squared molecular diameter times Avogadro's number times P. Okay, so our previous expression was actually in terms of Boltzmann's constant, but keep in mind that Boltzmann's constant is equal to R divided by Avogadro's number. Okay, so these two expressions are equivalent. Alright, so let's just input all these expressions inside our expression for eta. So we have 5 pi over 32. Okay, so expression for mean free path, that is RT, divided by 2 pi dA squared NAP times square root of RT over M pi times the density expression, which is PM over RT. Okay, so a bunch of things are going to cancel out right now. So we, our RT terms cancel out, our pi terms cancel out, the pressure term cancels out. Okay, so... We also have square root of 8 divided by square root of 2, so that is equal to square root of 4. So that simplifies to just 2, so let's just cancel this out and then add a 2 over here. Alright, and what else? Okay, so we have square root of m on the bottom here and m over here, so we could do a bunch of manipulations. So we could square m and get the square root of it, okay, so that's just equal to m on its own. So we could do some manipulations on these two over here, so this cancels out, okay, and then we're left with square root of m on top. Okay, so what else cancels out? Okay, that's it for now, okay? So if we simplify all of this, we could write this as, okay, so 5 over 16 now, okay, so 2 over 32, that's just 16, and we have... Okay, let's also include one of the constants here. So square root of pi times, okay, so we have square root of m times square root of rt. And on the bottom here, we still have Avogadro's number times the molecular diameter squared. All right, so this is overall our expression that we could just rearrange in order to solve for dA. Okay, so if we rearrange this and solve for dA, so the molecular diameter is going to be equal to, okay, so we'll just bring this up and bring the 
a to term down this is going to be 5 over 16 pi times square root of mrt divided by na okay viscosity coefficient plus we got to square root the whole thing All right so this is the expression for molecular diameter okay so why is it so important to be able to solve for molecular diameter because note that the experimental parameter that we'll be using as a basis for this is just viscosity coefficient okay so we can make measurements on our gas at certain conditions of pressure and temperature and measure its viscosity and calculate its viscosity coefficient so once we know this we'll be able to apply this equation over here Okay, in order to solve for molecular diameter, which is a very hard parameter to measure directly. All right, so let's try to apply this equation with this problem over here. So we're given the viscosity coefficient of chlorine gas at the given conditions. So we want to calculate its molecular diameter. All right, so let's write down the equation that we just derived earlier. So we know that the molecular diameter is going to be equal to... 5 over 16 times square root of pi times molecular weight times RT over Avogadro's number times the viscosity coefficient. Okay, so it looks like it's going to be an easy case of plug and play, but we just have to be a little bit wary with the problem solving, especially since the units might not cancel out as cleanly. Okay? So we just want to make sure that we end up with the appropriate units at the end of this calculation. So we're calculating for a molecular diameter, right? So we have to have, in terms of SI units, the meter as our final units once everything cancels out over here. Okay? So it might seem like a lengthy process, but it's a very good idea to start doing some dimensional analysis just to double check if your calculations and your unit conversions are okay all right so let's input everything here okay so we'll just have to be super careful about the units okay so 5 over 16 square root of pi okay so the thing inside here molecular weight times r times t okay so the r value that we're going to be using is 8.314 joules per mole kelvin okay so we're going to be multiplying this by a molecular weight which is in grams per mole okay so it's a good idea to expand this joules into the basic si unit so we've dis discussed this previously so this is equal to kilogram meter squared second squared okay so we're just going to write it out in this way once you write everything down here and this also gives us some insight as to what type of units m has to be in okay so we just want to make sure that instead of grams it's going to be in terms of kilograms okay so we just have to convert our molecular weight 70.9 grams per mole into kilograms okay so one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams okay so we're going to multiply this by r so that's 8.314 Okay, so we have kilograms, meter squared, second squared, over mole, kelvin. And our temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius, so just convert that to kelvin by adding 273.15. So that is going to be 293.15 kelvin. Right, so it looks really messy over here. Let's check out what the units are going to be a little later. Okay, so on the bottom, we have Avogadro's number times the viscosity coefficient. So the Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So don't forget the units. This is always going to be in terms of something. So one over mole. Okay, so that's Avogadro's number. All right, so how about for our viscosity coefficient? So that is 1.30 times 10 to the negative 5 Pascal second. Okay, so recall that the Pascal is the unit for pressure. So that is Newton over meter squared okay and this will be multiplying by second okay so there we go so this this is our equation for now we just have to make sure that everything turns out all right okay so let's just analyze the units first before we plug everything in our calculators okay so gram gram cancels out kelvin kelvin cancels out on top here and that's pretty much it okay so let's write down on this side over here just some unit analysis okay so inside this square root over here we have 
kilogram kilogram so that is kilogram squared and we have meter squared second squared and we have mole mole that's remaining on the bottom okay so we have mole squared second squared meter squared all right so on the bottom here the denominator we have newton okay so what is your newton equivalent to again okay so our newton is kilograms meters second squared okay, and then we're going to be multiplying this by second and dividing this by meter squared okay so we just need to cancel simplify this so meters okay this the square cancels out here okay second second cancels out over here okay so also don't forget we also have moles over here on the bottom all right so let's simplify this if we square root all of this by the way the whole thing here is square rooted okay so let's check out what the units are going to be so we have kilograms meters mole second divided by kilograms okay what else do we have here moles meters second all right, and then we have to square root the whole thing. Okay, so let's check out what cancels out. So kilogram, kilogram cancels out. Mole, mole cancels out. Second, second cancels out. And these don't exactly cancel out. What we have here, this is equivalent to m on top and 1 over m here, square root. Okay, so you could bring this up, and this is equal to meter squared square root. So thankfully, our final unit is indeed the meter. Okay, so... You should be confident at this point in plugging in all these values now. All right, so if you plug in all these values, the value that we'll get is 5.35 times 10 to the negative to the negative 10 meters. Okay, so this is the molecular diameter of chlorine gas. All right. So it might seem like a lot of trouble just to try to do all this unit analysis, but it's a good way to double check your work, okay? So there you have it, okay? So let's now let's, now let's look at the viscosity of liquids, okay? So when we look at the experimental trends in terms of temperature and viscosity, when we increase the temperature, we'll notice that for liquids, the viscosity coefficient actually decreases. So this is the opposite trend compared to gases. So again, let's try to rationalize this. So again, the two sources of internal friction include momentum transfer and intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so for liquids, the, we know that they are condensed phases, so they tend to have stronger intermolecular forces of attraction. And in terms of momentum transfer, their kinetic energies aren't necessarily going to be as large compared to gases. Okay, so for liquids, the major source of internal friction is going to be their intermolecular forces of attraction rather than momentum transfer. So that's why this trend over here makes sense. Okay, so if we increase the temperature, we increase the kinetic energy of the molecules to the extent that it's able to escape some of the intermolecular force of attraction, but not enough to cause the momentum transfer effect to overcome the effect of intermolecular forces of attraction. So we know this intuitively. So overall, if we increase the intermolecular forces of attraction present in a liquid, we know that the viscosity is also going to increase. So again, going back to the example that we discussed earlier, we know that water and honey have very different viscosities at the same conditions okay so water it only has a couple of hyd possible hydrogen bonding sites okay compared to honey okay honey is made up of a bunch of different sugars which have a lot of oh groups that could interact with each other okay so we know that honey is super viscous Okay, so we can definitely see the effect of intermolecular forces of attraction in terms of the viscosity of liquids. All right, so how do we measure the viscosity of liquids in particular? Okay, so we can use Poisson's equation. So this allows us to quantify the viscosity coefficient by relating the flow of the liquid through a capillary. So Poisson's equation is given as follows. So eta is equal to pi r raised to 4. So r is the radius of the capillary times the pressure head. Okay, so the pressure head is the pressure exerted by the liquid column inside the capillary. Okay, so it's going to be dependent on the density of your liquid 
okay, and the height of the column, okay, so we could just rewrite this as rho gh, okay, and it's also related to time, okay, so this is the time it takes for the liquid to pass through given points in a capillary over 8 L, which is the length of capillary, and V, okay, so the volume of liquid that passes through, okay, so the problem with this is that it's kind of hard to measure directly the radius of the capillary, okay, so what's done instead is that in order to measure the viscosity of an unknown liquid, we just uh, refer to a reference liquid, okay, and do some comparisons, okay, so the typical method of measurement is to use the Oswald viscometer, Okay, so some of you might have used this in the laboratory before, but overall the setup is as follows. Okay, so you place your liquid inside here and you draw up the height of the liquid so that it could start up at this point here. Okay, so just beyond this point maybe. Okay, so you could do that with an aspirator. So once you let the liquid start flowing down, okay, so you should note the time that it passes through here. Okay, and then you allow the liquid to run down. Okay, so it'll be passing through here, and you should measure the time that it takes the liquid to flow from this point to point B. Okay, so that time is going to be your time T. Okay, so usually what's done is that this instrument is used twice okay so you measure the time of flow for a liquid of known viscosity and known density and then you measure your unknown liquid okay so you should know the density of your unknown liquid and you just have to measure the time and from that you'll be able to determine the viscosity of your unknown liquid okay so the way that this is done is that we just compare these two values okay so we know that eight of one for example is going to be pi times the density of our first substance times gh okay so h is going to be the same for both cases because we're using the same instrument okay and they're going to be running through the same heights okay times r raised to four t1 so this is another variable so it's going to take different times for our fluids to run through over 8 lv Okay, so we're just going to divide this by the expression for our second substance. Okay, so the viscosity of our second substance is equal to pi rho 2 gh times r raised to 4 times t2. Okay, so this is our other parameter over 8 LV. Okay, so a bunch of things are going to cancel out. Okay, so pi, pi cancels out. gh, gh cancels out. The radius raised to 4 cancels out, 8 LV cancels out, and what we're left with is eta 1 over eta 2 is equal to density 1 times T1 over density 2 times T2, right? So you could use this equation in order to solve for the viscosity coefficient of an unknown liquid. Okay, so you just need to have a reference. So that reference is usually water. Okay, so the properties of water are very uh, well documented at lots of different temperatures. So you would be able to know the viscosity of water and its density at the given temperature. Okay, so you could just measure the time that it takes water to pass through this Oswald viscometer. And then your second run, you could measure the time that it takes for your unknown liquid to pass through as well. Okay, so you just need to know the density so that you could calculate its viscosity coefficient, okay? So let's try that out right now with this problem. So we'll be calculating for the viscosity of our unknown organic liquid, okay? So we're given all these parameters that we need. We're given density, we're given time, and we're also given the viscosity coefficient of our reference compound, which is water, all right? So let's just set up our equation first. Okay, so we know that our equation is just the ratio. So let's set the viscosity coefficient, the unknown viscosity coefficient as eta sub x. Okay, so this is going to be equal to the density of the unknown times the times the time it takes to run through the Oswald viscometer divided by the viscosity coefficient of the reference divided by the density of the reference and we have the time it takes for the reference okay so just rearranging we'll be solving for the viscosity coefficient of the unknown so we just have this expression 
times eta of the reference. Okay, so solving for this, okay, so just plug in all your values. This should be really friendly for solving. Okay, so the density of the unknown is 0 0.87752 grams per ml. And the time it takes to flow through is 61.732 seconds. Okay, and for the reference, the density is 0 0.99997 grams per ml. And the time it takes to flow through is 32.933 seconds. Okay, so let's multiply this ratio by the viscosity coefficient of water. So that is 8.90 times 10 to the negative 4 pascal second. Okay, so these are going to cancel out. Second seconds are going to cancel out. You're left with the appropriate viscosity coefficient units. Okay, so the viscosity of our unknown is going to be 1.46 times 10 to the negative 3 pascal second. All right, so very nice friendly calculations here. Okay, so that is the viscosity for a liquid. Okay, so there's many other ways that we could measure the viscosity of a liquid. So you could also use Stokes' law, for example, but we'll limit our discussion to the use of Poisson's equation. Okay, so our next property that we'll be talking about is surface tension. So surface tension results from uneven forces acting on the surface of a liquid. Okay, so formally you could also define it as the work needed to increase the surface area of a liquid. Okay, so given this definition, we could assign units to surface tension here. So we, again, we define surface tension to be work to increase surface area, so work per change in surface area. So the unit's going to be Newton per, okay, a little correction here, meter. Okay, all right, so again, let's look at this picture over here of a liquid inside a container. Okay, so keep in mind again that your liquid molecules are always going to be surrounded by other liquid molecules. So if you're looking at a molecule inside the bulk, okay, your molecule is going to be surrounded by a bunch of other molecules so it's going to be attracted in all sorts of different directions so overall we have a nicely balanced force for our molecule in our bulk however if we look at molecules at the surface the case is going to be a little bit different since there's no force for surface molecules to balance out the pull inwards okay so therefore these molecules here on the surface they tend to be in a higher energy state so this is not really that favorable if you have a lot of uneven energies around here. So what's, what's being done instead is to minimize surface area of a liquid. Okay, so this is going to maximize these types of interactions. Okay, so liquid-liquid contact and it's going to minimize non-contact here. It's going to minimize liquid interfaces. Okay, so that's why we tend to see water droplets rolling themselves up into spheres. Okay, so it does not really want to wet the surface in some cases, okay? especially if the surface is super hydrophobic. Okay, so how do we measure surface tension? So the major method that's being used is so-called capillary rise method. Okay, so if you dip a capillary into a liquid, the tendency is, is that your liquid is going to rise. Okay, up into a certain height. Okay, so this is due to the surface tension that the liquid experiences along the circumference of the capillary. Okay, so what happens here is actually that the surface tension, which provides an upward force over here, it just balances out the mass of this liquid column over here. Okay, so the exact height of this, I know, of how much liquid is going to rise in a capillary is going to be dependent on the properties of your liquid. Okay, so let's check out how we could derive an expression for this. Okay, so again, in the capillary rise method, we have an upward force, which is due to surface tension, and we also have a downward force, which is due to the weight of the fluid column. Okay, so again, our upward force is due to surface tension, and our downward force, this is due to the weight of 
fluid column. Okay, so let's investigate this over here, the surface tension. Okay, so keep in mind that the liquid is going to be in contact with the circumference of the capillary. Okay, so let's just look at a cross section over here. Okay, so our surface tension is going to be acting along this direction. Okay, so here's our surface tension, but what we're interested in is an upward force, okay? So let's check out the angle of contact with the fluid and the glass interface, okay? So we're interested in the upward force only, so that's the force that's balancing out the downward force. So this is going to be equal to surface tension times cosine theta, okay? So just for interest, the force going in this direction is going to be surface tension times sine theta. All right. So this is only for this particular area, but keep in mind that you also have a bunch of surface tension along the entire circumference. Okay. So just draw out the circumference over here. Okay. So the circumference of the capillary is equal to 2 pi r. So you need to multiply this entire term by the circumference. Okay, so keep in mind in our derivation of this term over here, we just considered a single point here, but this surface tension is present along the entire circumference of the interface of our liquid and the glass capillary. Okay, so this is our this is going to be our upward force. Okay, so now let's consider the downward force. Okay, so the downward force. This is just going to be weight, okay? So F is equal to mass times acceleration, and the acceleration is the gravitational acceleration, okay? So how do we get the mass from the weight of this fluid column, okay? So we can make use of the density and the volume of the liquid inside here, okay? So density, this is defined as mass over volume, right? Okay, so... We could use the properties of the fluid and also the geometry of our capillary in order to calculate for the mass. Okay, so mass, this is equal to volume times density. So what is the volume going to be? Let's assume that the volume is going to be a perfect cylinder. So the volume is going to be equal to, okay, so the area of a circle that is pi r squared and the height of the cylinder which is h okay so the height is going to be the height of the liquid rise okay so the mass is going to be equal to this volume times density all right so in order to calculate the downward force we need to multiply the mass by the gravitational ac acceleration constant okay so this force is equal to pi r squared h density times g all right, so let's set these two expressions equal to one another, okay? So the upward force is equal to 2 pi r gamma cosine theta is equal to pi r squared, the height of the fluid column times the density times g. All right, so a bunch of things cancel out here. So pi cancels out, one of the r's cancels out, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so let's solve for the surface tension. So surface tension is now going to be equal to, okay, so we have r h density of the liquid times the gravitational acceleration constant divided by 2 cosine theta, okay? All right, so again, theta is the angle of contact of the liquid on the glass capillary but usually for approximation purposes we could assume that the liquid completely wets the capillary walls so in that case we could set theta as equal to zero so that means that cosine theta or cosine zero is going to be equal to one so an approximated equation that we could use is theta is equal to rh density times g divided by just two Okay, all right, so let's try to apply this equation in this example here, okay? So we'll be using capillary tubes to draw up blood, okay? So we want to determine the height that the blood rises in the capillary, and we're also given the radius of the capillary, okay? So again, this looks like a plug-and-play situation, but we just have to be very careful again with the units, okay? 
So let's write down the equation that we know and then rearrange it to solve for what we're looking for. Okay, so surface tension is equal to RH density G divided by 2. Okay, so we're assuming that blood completely wets the capillary, so we could assume that theta is equal to 0. Therefore, cosine 0 is equal to 1. Right, so let's solve for H since the problem is asking for the height at which blood rises in a capillary. So H is going to be equal to 2 gamma over R rho G. Okay, all right, so let's try to plug these things in and then we'll see what type of unit conversions we need to do. Okay, so H is going to be equal to 2 times, okay, so the surface tension is 0 0.058 Newton meter divided by... Okay, so the radius of the capillary is given in millimeters, so we just need to convert this to meters. So 0 0.334 millimeters okay, times 1 meter, which is equivalent to 1,000 millimeters. And now we need to have the density. So the density is given in terms of grams per ml. Okay, so we need to convert these into... SI units, okay, so let's convert this to grams and meter cubed, okay, so 1.0506 grams per ml, okay, so convert the grams to kilograms, so one kilogram contains a thousand grams, and then we need to convert this ml in terms of meter cubed, okay, so we need to have the a thousand meter milliliters on top here, one liter, and then we need to convert the liters to meter cubed. Okay, so a thousand liters is equivalent to one meter cubed. Okay, so our final units for density here is kilograms per meter cubed now. Okay, so how about the gravitational constant here? So the gravitational acceleration constant is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay. So let's break down this Newton, by the way. So the Newton is equal to kilograms meters per second squared. Okay, so just to give us an idea of what we need to cancel out. So let's just remove this and rewrite this as kilograms meters second squared divided by meters. So this cancels out as well. Okay, so again, let's just do some unit cancellation. So millimeters, millimeters, um, gram, gram ml ml liters liters okay so we also see second squared second squared canceling out so what else we also have here we have meters here and meters here but we have divided by meter cubed so this ends up being meter squared over meter cubed so this becomes one over one over meter okay so this ultimately becomes just meter, okay, which is a good thing since we're looking for a height, right? So this height has to be in terms of meter. Okay, so plugging in all of this now, since we're all good with the unit conversions, our answer is going to be 0 0.0337 meters, okay? So this is also equivalent to 3.37 centimeters, right? So this is the height that the blood is going to rise inside the capillary. All right, so these are the two uh, fluid properties that we'll be talking about in this discussion. So our next topic is going to be the interaction of our fluids with the surface of a solid. So namely, we'll be looking now at adsorption. Okay, so adsorption is described as the attachment of a substance on the surface of a solid or a liquid. Okay, so the reverse of this is desorption. Okay, so just be careful about confusing adsorption and absorption. So absorption is defined as when a substance flows through something. Okay, so like water flowing through a sponge. Okay, so the sponge is absorbing the water. Okay, so in adsorption, okay, we have some adherence of something on the surface of something. Okay, so what do we call these somethings? Okay, so these somethings are called the adsorbent. Okay, so the adsorbent is the solid or liquid. So this is the substance that adsorbs. And the thing that gets attached is the adsorbate or the substrate. All right. 
So let's look more at the properties of adsorbents. Okay, so what's really important about adsorbents is that it needs to have a high surface area in order to be a good adsorbent. So examples of adsorbents include silica gel, charcoal, and activated carbon. Okay, so let's look at the structural properties of activated carbon. Okay, so this is a piece of activated carbon. So note that it has a lot of pores. Okay, so it has a very high surface area. So there's a lot of opportunity for substrates to start attaching onto the surface. Okay, so a usual test to evaluate the surface area of a substance is to use methylene blue. Okay, so we could mix our adsorbent with methylene blue and see if it can decolorize a solution. Okay, so there's a lot of applications for adsorbents, so it's typically used as purifying agents. So in our water filters, we have a lot of activated carbon that could adsorb a lot of impurities. Okay, so the basic principle is, is that if we have a high surface area, we tend to have a greater adsorbed substrate. So what's What's a little bit problematic about surface area, however, is that it's hard to measure. Okay, so actually what we do in order to measure surface area of something is to do adsorption studies. But for many purposes, we also just associate surface area with the mass of the adsorbent. Okay, so we're going to assume that it's proportional to one another. Okay, so the mass of adsorbent okay, is related to the surface area of the adsorbent. Okay, so let's look at different types of adsorption. So there's two major types based on the way that our adsorbate is going to adsorb. Okay, so the first type is chemisorption. Okay, so our adsorbates are going to come in and start forming chemical bonds with our adsorbent. Okay, so another type of adsorption is just physisorption. Okay, so instead of chemical bonds being formed, we have just weak intermolecular forces of attraction that's holding the adsorbates onto the surface of our adsorbent. Okay, so the major differences between this, these two is that chemisorption is characterized by very high enthalpies of adsorption because, of course, we're dealing with chemical bonds, whereas physisorption deals with relatively smaller um, enthalpies of adsorption since we're just dealing with the relatively weaker intermolecular force of attraction that's holding these adsorbates onto the surface of our adsorbent. Okay, so let's look more closely at the process of adsorption. Okay, so adsorption, this is actually just another um, equilibrium process. Okay, so we could symbolize it by this um, equilibrium equation over here. So A, okay, this is our adsorbate. Okay, and we have S, which is the surface of our adsorbent. Okay, so the forward reaction is when A adsorbs onto the surface of our adsorbent, forming an occupied surface. Okay, so we have the adsorbate adsorbent complex. Okay, so the process is reversible. Okay, so the reverse process is just called desorption. Okay, so keep in mind that in the forward process of adsorption, we're forming bonds on the surface of the adsorbent. Okay, whether these bonds are chemical or just um, intermolecular forces of attraction, the adsorption process is always going to be an exothermic process. Okay, so again, you're forming new bonds on the surface of your adsorbent. Okay, so what's expected about the behavior of this equilibrium then is that if you increase the temperature, okay, so what's going to happen if you increase the temperature for an equilibrium system that is exothermic? Okay, so what's going to happen here is that if you increase the temperature, you're going to decrease adsorption. Okay, all right. So let's check out another effect, the effect of pressure for gases on the extent of adsorption. Okay, so ultimately what we're looking at here is the effect of the amount of our adsorbate on the process of adsorption. Okay, so for gases, we'll be looking at the effect of pressure. And if we're dealing with solute adsorbates, we could look at this in terms of concentration. Okay, so overall, based on Le Chatelier's principle, if we increase the pressure, okay, we're increasing the pressure of this um, reactant, the expectation is that the equilibrium is going to be pushed forward. Okay, so we're going to have increased adsorption. 
Okay. However, this isn't exactly your typical type of reaction because there are limitations to this process. Okay. The limitation is that there is a limited available surface for adsorption. Okay. So it doesn't mean that if you have a lot of adsorbate that you're going to have unlimited adsorption. Okay. So there's going to be a point where all of your surface is already occupied. So no matter how much you increase the pressure of your gas, or the amount of adsorbate in your system, there's no longer going to be any adsorption and you won't be able to push the equilibrium any further. Okay, so that's why we're interested in looking at so called fractional coverage. Okay, so in this particular picture over here, our adsorbent is completely occupied. Okay, so as in all the possible sites for occupation are already filled up with an adsorbate. Okay, so fractional coverage is defined as theta, and theta is equal to the number of adsorption sites occupied divided by the number of sites available. So in the case where our adsorbent is completely occupied, our fractional coverage is now 1. Okay, so the range for fractional coverage can be 0 to 1. Okay, so let's look at different ways in which we study adsorption and measure fractional coverage. So what we're usually interested in is to determine how good of an adsorbent a material is and how much of a particular adsorbate it can absorb. So what we do is that we expose the adsorbent to some controlled amount of adsorbate. We wait a while until equilibrium is reached. Then we measure the amount of adsorbate that gets absorbed on the surface at constant temperature. So ultimately what we're doing is that we're varying the amount of adsorbate and we're going to measure its effect on the amount of adsorbate adsorbed, which is related to fractional coverage. So fractional coverage is usually expressed in terms of moles. So the number of moles of adsorbate that gets absorbed over n infinity. Okay, so n infinity is the number of moles that completely covers the surface of the adsorbent at saturated conditions. It represents the maximum amount of adsorbate that the adsorbent can accommodate. However, what's typically done is that instead of number of moles, we measure a parameter that's more easily measured instead of number of moles, namely the volume of gas. So recall from your gas laws that the number of moles of gas is directly proportional to its volume. So instead what we usually calculate is the volume of gas that gets absorbed over volume sub infinity. So how exactly is the adsorbed gas volume measured? So what's typically done is that this part gets removed. Then the remaining gas is placed in another vessel at set temperature and pressure. So the difference between the original amount of gas and the gas measured here in terms of volume is the corresponding amount of gas it got absorbed. So we're really interested in determining the effect of pressure, okay? So the initial amount of gas on theta, okay? So keep in mind that our independent variable x is going to be pressure and our dependent variable y is going to be theta or the volume of gas absorbed. Note that V infinity here, this is going to be a constant that is characteristic for the adsorption system. Also, since we're measuring these in constant temperature, we call these isotherms. So we can construct theoretical models to picture the isothermal adsorption process, and the simplest model that we can construct is the Langmuir isotherm. Okay, so there's several assumptions that come along with this isotherm. Okay, so the first assumption is that we only have monolayer coverage. Okay, so if we have a single layer of a molecule on the surface of our adsorbent, okay, another layer can't start attaching anymore. Okay, another assumption is that all adsorption sites are equivalent. Okay, so that means we have a homogeneous type of surface, okay? So all sites are characterized by an equal energy, okay? So the enthalpy of adsorption is going to be equal regardless of whether the site is nearby any other sites that are free or occupied, okay? An additional thing is that the adsorption of any molecule 
into an empty site won't be affected by the presence of other adsorbed molecules. In other words, there's no adsorbate-adsorbate interactions, okay? So we're not really considering whether this molecule is going to be attracted to these other molecules here, okay? So this molecule is going to adsorb into the site without any care for whether it's next to any other filled sites, okay? So overall, an equilibrium is going to be established between adsorption and desorption, okay? So we could characterize this equilibrium again by the equation we have here, okay? So let's just specify how we could express these terms here, okay? So we know that A, if we have a gaseous adsorbate, can be expressed as pressure, okay? So how about the surface, the free surface, and the occupied surface, okay? So the occupied surface, this can be characterized by your fractional coverage, Okay, so if we want to figure out the available surfaces, okay, we just need to subtract how many sites are already covered, okay? So that means the available surface is just going to be equal to 1 minus the fraction of sites already occupied. So we could look more closely at this equilibrium. So keep in mind that for equilibrium, the rates of the forward and the reverse processes are going to be equal. Okay, so what is going to be the rate of adsorption okay so the rate of absorption is the forward process okay so we have some rate constants written over here so rate of adsorption that's going to be equal to okay the rate constant ka times the concentration of our reactants so in this case it's going to be the amount of adsorbate which is characterized by p and the amount of available surface, which is characterized by 1 minus theta. Okay, so the reverse process, so the rate of desorption, again, it's just going to be the reverse process, so it's going to be the rate constant, so that is KD, times the reactant. In this case, it's going to be the occupied surface. Okay, so that is just going to be characterized by theta, okay? So these are the two rates. So keep in mind that eventually that an equilibrium is going to be established. And what do we know about the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions when equilibrium is established? We know that these rates are going to be equal to one another, okay? So at equilibrium, we could write down this expression here, okay? So again, at equilibrium... Our equation is the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. So that means the rate of the forward reaction, Ka times P1 minus theta, is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, which is Kd times theta. Okay, so let's just rearrange this expression and let's look, let's try to derive an expression for theta. Okay, so let's uh, multiply this out. Okay, so we have Ka p minus kap theta is equal to kd theta so transfer this on the other side and isolate theta so we have kap is equal to theta minus theta times kd plus kap okay so solving for theta theta now becomes kap divided by kd plus kap all right so so far we have this expression for now but keep in mind that since we're in equilibrium we could write down an equilibrium constant for adsorption so big k this is our adsorption equilibrium constant Okay, so this term is important because it tells us something about the tendency of adsorption to happen in our system. Okay, so the larger it is, the more forward the adsorption process tends to happen. Okay, so K again, this is just going to be equal to the rate constant of the forward over the rate constant of the reverse reaction. Okay, so if we rewrite this, okay, so if we divide the top and the bottom by KD. Okay, so this is just a form of one, right? Okay, so we can get KA over KD times P over, so KD divided by KD, that's just one, 
plus Ka over Kd times P. So this here is our equilibrium constant. So we could rewrite this as theta is equal to big K times P divided by 1 plus Kp. Alright, so this expression here characterizes the Langmuir isotherm. Okay, it relates the fraction of sites occupied by, by the conditions like pressure and the equilibrium constant for the adsorption process. All right, so let's try to plot this for different values of K and for different pressures. Okay, so we'll look at a plot of theta versus pressure. Okay, so this is a plot of fractional coverage versus pressure for different values of K. So note its typical behavior, okay? So at first it starts rising. So it looks like it has a linear behavior at the start and it starts to reach a plateau, okay? So the maximum value that it approaches is equal to one, which makes sense because at one, all sites are occupied, okay? So let's check out the behavior at low pressures, for example. So earlier we said that at low pressures we look like it looks like there's a linear relationship. Okay, so at low pressures, okay, let's look at the behavior of the denominator over here. Okay, so at low pressures we could say that one can be greater than the value Kb. So that means the denominator one plus Kb just approaches one. Okay, so therefore our expression theta just becomes approximately equal to k times p, okay, which is a linear expression. Okay, so what happens at high pressures? Okay, so high pressures are around this area of the graph over here. Okay, so at high pressures we can say that the term kp is much larger than k1. Okay, so Kp is much larger than K1. So this means that the value of the denominator, which is originally equal to 1 plus Kp, this pretty much just approaches Kp since 1 becomes negligible compared to the value of Kp. So our full expression for theta, theta becomes Kp over Kp, so it just becomes equal to 1, which is consistent to what we observe for this particular curve over here. Okay. So eventually these uh, curves will also each reach one, but since this particular curve has a higher K value, a higher equilibrium constant, it reaches saturation at a lower pressure. All right. Okay, so another question that we should address is how can we tell if our actual experimental data fits with the Langmuir isotherm? Okay, so what we're gonna do here is that we're going to get our experimental data and then we're going to be curve fitting it to the model that we have here okay so if it happens to fit very nicely okay so we could say that the adsorption follows this type of model and we could use the different parameters that describes the Langmuir isotherm such as the equilibrium constant and also the v sub infinity in order to describe the adsorption of our system all right so let's derive an expression that we could use in order to curve fit our data. So for theta, we said that we could express this in terms of the volume of the gas that is absorbed on the surface divided by the volume of the gas at maximum coverage, at full coverage. Okay, so this is going to be equal to the expression that we got. Okay, so Kp Okay, so the pressure of the gas over 1 plus Kp. Okay, so if our equation is used as is, it's kind of hard to use this equation. Okay, so it's hard to fit our data to this form of our equation. So what's being done instead, and this is a very common trend for other sorts of systems, is that we try to get a linear form of this equation and try to fit it using linear regression, which is a much easier sort of curve fitting that we can do. Okay, so what we're going to do for this expression here is that we're going to get the reciprocal. Okay, as in we're just going to flip the whole equation over. Okay, so that means V infinity is going to be on top divided by V is equal to 1 plus Kb 
divided by kp okay so let's just do a little bit of rearrangement okay so let's swap the v infinity and the pressures here so we have pressure over v is equal to 1 plus kp divided by kv infinity okay so let's split up this term over here okay so let's bring this up here so p over v is now equal to 1 over kv infinity plus kp over kv infinity okay so these k's cancel out and our final expression is going to be p over v is equal to 1 over kv infinity plus 1 over v infinity times pressure okay so this equation might not look too pretty but there's a certain way that you could look at it okay so this pressure over here okay so the pressure of your system of your gas for example so the pressure of your gas can be set as x okay and then you can set the pressure divided by the volume of the gas adsorbed as your y variable okay so you could make an equation of a line okay so this term over here this is going to be equal to your slope and this term over here this is going to be equal to your y intercept okay so this is the linear form of the Langmuir isotherm okay so if we have data that includes different pressure conditions of our gas and we could measure the amount of gas that is actually absorbed on the surface okay by measuring its volume okay we could figure out several parameters we could figure out k the equilibrium constant of the adsorption process and we could also figure out v infinity okay so what is v infinity again this is the volume of gas at complete coverage okay so you could figure out the amount of gas needed in order to completely cover the entire surface of your adsorbent okay so this could also give you some hints as to the surface area of your adsorbent all right, so let's try to apply this. So we're given this data over here. Okay, so the data given below are for the absorption of carbon monoxide on charcoal at 273 Kelvin. Okay, so we're going to confirm if the data fits a Langmuir isotherm. And if it does, we're going to find the constant K and the volume corresponding to complete coverage. Okay, so in each case, the volume has been corrected to 1 atmosphere. Okay, so the first thing to do is to calculate the y variable okay so recall again that our expression the expression that we'll be plotting is p over v is equal to 1 over k v infinity plus 1 over v infinity times the pressure okay so this term over here is okay so we have our x variable already okay and then we just need to get the value of y okay so for each pressure value you'll be dividing it by the corresponding volume okay so again what are we doing in this experiment again just to remind you guys okay so in this particular experiment okay so the experimenter varied the pressure of the gas okay and then they measured what is the amount of gas that was absorbed onto the surface okay so at this particular pressure this volume of gas was absorbed Okay, so that's why they say that in each case, the volume has been corrected to one atmosphere. So when we remove the gas that has been absorbed at one atmosphere and 273 Kelvin, this is what they measured. Okay, all right, so this is going to be our Y value. So I went ahead and calculated this in Excel, but you can also do this in your calculators. Okay, so here we have our X column. This is pressures. And then we have our volumes, okay? So we just needed to divide each pressure by the corresponding volumes measured. And we have our Y variable here, okay? So this is pressure over volume. So note the units, okay? So the units of our Y variable is going to be kilopascal per centimeter cubed. So if we plot these points over here and construct a line of best fit, we get the following plot here, okay? So this is the line of best fit and we also have our pearson coefficient squared which tells us that we have a very good linear relationship between our 
data points. Okay, so what we want to get here is the slope and the intercept of our points. Okay, so the slope tells us something about the variables, right? Okay, so the slope, recall again from our equation, the slope should be equal to 1 over v infinity. Okay, so if we get the reciprocal of our slope, we will be able to solve for the volume corresponding to complete coverage. So getting the inverse of the slope gives us 111 centimeter cubed. Okay, so the intercept on the other hand gives us the value 1 over okay, k times v infinity. Okay, so luckily from the slope we were able to solve for what v infinity is. Okay, so we could solve for what k is from this value over here. Okay, so the intercept again, this is equal to 1.1972. This is equal to 1 over k v infinity. Okay, so solving for k, we have 1.1972 times v infinity. So that is 111 cm cubed. Okay, so what's the units for the y-intercept? Okay, so the units for the y-axis is kilopascals per centimeter cubed, right? So kilopascals per centimeter cubed. So if you multiply this by the volume at complete coverage, the centimeter cubed cancels out, and the units that we will get for k is going to be in terms of kilopascals. All right, so if we calculate this, this should be 7.53 times 10 to the negative 3 kilopascals okay so these values are of interest to us so that we can evaluate the quality of our of our adsorbate okay so the higher the value of k for example the better the adsorbent is for our adsorbate okay so it's also of interest to know the volume corresponding to complete coverage to evaluate how much of the gas can actually adsorb at saturating conditions, okay? So that's what makes the Langmuir isotherm particularly useful because it gives us these parameters that we can use to quantify the quality of adsorption, okay? But there are several limitations for the Langmuir isotherm, okay? So namely, that it does not account for heterogeneous surfaces, okay? So recall again the assumption that the enthalpy for adsorption is the same for all occupation sites, okay? So this isn't necessarily going to be true, especially if we have heterogeneous surfaces, namely rough surfaces. So the energy of our absorption are, is going to be different for these different occupation sites. In addition, it does not take into account adsorbate adsorbate interactions okay so of course if our adsorbates start to approach surfaces that are near occupied sites okay so expectedly you know that your adsorbate is going to start interacting with one another so the Langmuir isotherm does not take that into account okay so it also does not consider greater than monolayer adsorption Okay, so actually several layers of adsorption are possible, but the Langmuir isotherm just assumes that as soon as you have a single layer of molecules adsorbed on the surface, no adsorption can happen anymore. Okay, so there's a lot of other um, isotherms that um, model the adsorption process and take into account these different limitations of the Langmuir isotherm. So one of these isotherms is the Frundlich isotherm. So actually this is more of an empirically derived isotherm. So it just states that the amount of gas adsorbed per adsorbent just increases exponentially. As in what it tries to do is that it tries to account for multi-layer adsorption. Okay, so it just gives us an equation that tries to fit experimental data. Okay, so it doesn't really give us any insight as to what A or B actually means. All right, so what we can do, however, is that we could try to fit our data with this isotherm equation. So we'll be doing something similar to what we did earlier with our Langmuir isotherm. Okay, so we're going to try to linearize the Frundlich isotherm, and from that we could try to get an equation that we could use to verify our data. Right, so again, we could use the same expression. So theta, this can be expressed as v over v infinity. Okay, so this is going to be equal to the Frundlich isotherm. So that was given as a times the pressure raised to 1 over b. 
So keep in mind that A and B are just Frundlich isotherm constants, so they don't necessarily have any physical interpretation. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to just do some rearrangement. So V is equal to V infinity A times P raised to 1 over B. Okay, so since we have this exponential part, it's going to be useful to get the logarithm of both sides. Okay, so log V is equal to log V theta A times P 1 over B. Okay, so we could separate this using the properties of logarithms. Okay, so we could write this as log V infinity times A plus log P raised to 1 over P. Okay, so this exponent part here can be brought down based on the, the properties of logarithms. And our final expression is going to be log v is equal to log v infinity a plus 1 over b log p. Okay, so this over here, this is just going to be a constant. So we could rewrite this as just some constant k. Right, so log v, this is going to be equal to log k plus 1 over b log p. Okay, so you can see which expressions are going to be your x and your y's. So this over here, this is going to be your x variable. This over here, this is going to be your y variable. And the slope is going to yield you your 1 over b. And the intercept is going to give you log k. Alright, so this is the linear form of your front lake isotherm, which you could use to verify your data. Okay, so what we're going to do here is that we're going to do the problem that we did earlier, but just apply the front lake isotherm. Okay, so we'll be using the same data of the absorption of carbon monoxide on charcoal, and we're going to check if it actually conforms to the front lake isotherm, and we're also going to solve for the front lake isotherm constants. Okay, so again, what we need to plot here, okay, so let's just rewrite the expression that we need to plot. Okay, so we have log v is equal to log k plus 1 over b log p. Okay, so we just need to get the logarithms of both of these variables here. Okay, so over here, I just went ahead and got the logarithm expressions of these values. Okay, so we just need to plot your log p. This is going to be your x, and then plot this as your y variable. So plotting this and drawing the best fit line gives you the following expression over here. Okay, so you have the line of best fit, and you also have your r squared. Okay, so the value close to 1 also says that it fits the front leg isotherm quite well. Alright, so the slope here is given as 0.771948. Okay, so the slope from the front leg isotherm expression... This is equal to 1 over b. And the intercept, this is equal to log k. Okay, so if we just solve for this, so b is going to be equal to the inverse of our slope. So that is given as 1.30. And our k, okay, so we'll just raise this value to 10. So we'll just get 10 raised to the intercept in order to get the value of k. And that will give you 1.43. Alright, so these are just the empirical parameters for our front lake isotherm. Okay, so the front lake isotherm can be applied for many other cases, so sometimes it gives a better fit compared to the Langmuir isotherm. But again, these empirical parameters are just used to fit the data to the front lake isotherm equation. All right, so We'll end our discussion here, okay? So if you're interested in learning more about other isotherms, adsorption isotherms, so there's also the BET isotherm, the Temkin isotherm, so there's lots of different isotherms that you could use. You could also refer to other physical chemistry textbooks, okay? So if you're also interested in learning more about surface tension and viscosity, you could also refer to other physical chemistry textbooks, so Atkins is a very good reference for this, right? Okay, so I'll see you next time. So next time we will be discussing solids.